There are some mistakes that I see being made over and over again on the development of new electronic hardware products. And in this video, you're going to discover 10 of the most common mistakes made by entrepreneurs, startups, and small teams that are developing their first electronic product. Now, some of these mistakes are technical design mistakes and others are going to be more business related. So there's something here for everyone. And all 10 of these mistakes are equally critical. So be sure to watch the full video. Mistake number one is failing to design for manufacturing. People tend to underestimate the complexity of developing a new physical product. And they also underestimate the complexity of manufacturing it even more. For many products, it takes nearly as much time, sometimes even more, to get manufacturing up and running as it does to develop the product. Manufacturing setup can also cost much more than all of the development costs for some products. It's essential that manufacturability be a primary consideration during the entire product design process. This process is called Design for Manufacturing, or DFM. Nothing will slow down your path to market more than designing a product that can't be efficiently manufactured. The old way of thinking was that engineers develop a product and then pass it on to a manufacturer who would then figure out how to actually make it. There was little to no interaction at all between the engineering department and manufacturing. But that's a horrible way to develop products, which is why successful companies have abandoned this process long ago. It's much better to develop a product with manufacturing in mind from the very beginning. Also, don't forget about design for testability, which is all about designing your product so it can be easily tested during production. Mistake number two is incorrect design of wireless circuits. So if a product has any wireless functionality, the PCB layout for any RF portion is super critical. Unfortunately, it's done wrong more often than it's done right, so definitely pay close attention to this one. For maximum power transfer between a transceiver and the antenna, their impedance must be matched. This means two things are required. First is a proper transmission line connecting the antenna to the transceiver. This transmission line is fabricated on the PCB specifically for carrying microwaves, which is, are just high frequency radio waves. There are two common types of transmission lines used in PCB design, a microstrip and a coplanar waveguide. Now a microstrip is a conducting strip separated by a dielectric layer from a ground plane that's beneath it. A coplanar waveguide is similar to a microstrip except that it also adds another ground plane beside the conducting strip on the same PCB layer. Of the two styles, the coplanar waveguide is the most frequently used. In most cases, the transmission line needs to be designed with a 50 ohm impedance for maximum power transfer with the antenna. Now don't confuse this impedance specification with the simple resistance of the line. The 50 ohm impedance refers to the complex impedance from the transmission line to the surrounding ground planes. In addition to using a 50 ohm transmission line, it's usually necessary to also add some type of LC matching circuit like a Pi network. This allows fine tuning of the antenna impedance for optimal matching and maximum power transfer. One of the best ways to avoid these complexities, as well as reduce the cost to get your product certified, is to instead use a pre-certified module for any wireless functions. The number three mistake is waiting too long to estimate your manufacturing cost. Now this is a big one, because successful tech companies always know approximately how much a product is going to cost to manufacture it well before they begin full development. Otherwise, how can they even know the product is worth developing? If you're not a billion dollar tech company, well, the odds are that you're probably going to first get your product fully designed. And then once you have a final prototype and you're ready to start manufacturing, well, then you'll finally estimate how much the product is going to cost to manufacture. But what happens, though, if you discover that your product is going to cost more to manufacture than you expected? Well, you could increase your sales price target, but that obviously has negative consequences. You could also make some redesigns to lower the manufacturing costs, but wouldn't it have made more sense to just design it right the first time? For understandable reasons, many people think that you have to fully develop a product before you can accurately estimate the manufacturing cost. 
And that's absolutely untrue. With the right experience, it's possible to accurately estimate the manufacturing cost for just about any product. This can happen well before any PCB layout or 3D modeling occurs. Mistake number four is insufficient width for any high current PCB traces. If a PCB trace is gonna have more than roughly 500 milliamps flowing through it, then the minimum width allowed for a trace probably won't be sufficient. The required width of a PCB trace depends on several things, including the thickness of the trace itself or the copper weight, and whether the trace is on an internal or an external layer. For the same thickness, an external layer can carry more current for the same width than an internal trace because external traces have better airflow, allowing better heat dissipation. The thickness depends on how much copper is being used for that conducting layer. Most PCB manufacturers allow you to choose various copper weights from 0.5 ounces per square foot up to about 2.5 ounces per square foot. If preferred, you can even convert the copper weight to a thickness measurement, such as mills. When calculating the current carrying capability of a PCB trace, you must specify the permissible temperature rise for that trace. Generally, a 10 degrees C rise is a safe choice, but if you need to squeeze down the trace width more, you can use a 20 degrees C or higher allowed temperature rise. Although the calculations for trace width are pretty simple, I usually recommend using a trace width calculator, which can be found online. Mistake number five, not getting a design review. If you don't get an independent design review of your product before you prototype it, then you may be throwing money away. It doesn't matter how good an engineer may be, nobody is perfect, myself included for sure, and all engineers make mistakes. Getting custom prototypes made, whether it's the electronics PCB or the product's enclosure, isn't cheap. The more prototype iterations you require, the more it's going to cost you in total. It's also going to take a lot longer to develop and bring the product to market. Well, one of the best ways to reduce the number of prototype iterations required is to get a second opinion called a design review. Successful tech companies always require their engineers to hold design reviews to seek feedback from as many other engineers as possible. Unfortunately, many entrepreneurs, startups, and small companies make this mistake of completely skipping this critical step. Well, that's fine if you have the skills to sufficiently review the design yourself, but if you had those skills, you would have likely just done the design yourself in the first place. Mistake number six is incorrect use of decoupling capacitors. Critical components need a clean, stable voltage source, and decoupling capacitors are placed on the power rail to help in this regard. However, for decoupling capacitors to work their, their best, they must be as close as possible to the pin requiring the stable voltage. The power line coming from the power source needs to be routed so it goes to the decoupling capacitor before going to the pin needing a stable voltage. Also, it's critical to place the output capacitor for the power supply regulator as close as possible to the output pin of the regulator. And this is necessary for optimizing stability. This is because all regulators use a feedback loop that can oscillate if it's not properly stabilized. This capacitor being clo placed close to the output pin of the regulator also improves the transient response of the regulator. Mistake number seven, the product enclosure is not manufacturable. You've spent all this time and money getting the design of your product's enclosure to look just right. It's like a work of art to you. And this required a bunch of 3D printed prototype iterations to perfect its look and functionality. You finally have the perfect prototype. Now you just need to find a manufacturer to produce them in mass and you're good to go, right? Well, what if I told you that your enclosure design is useless and you need to essentially redesign the entire thing? That would be horrible to hear, but this is a very common occurrence. Well, 3D printing is really forgiving and you can design and print just about anything your mind can imagine. But 3D printing is only for producing prototypes. High pressure injection molding is the technology that's used for producing plastic parts in high volume. Well, unfortunately, injection molding is not at all forgiving. It's a technology with many design rules that must be closely followed. 
These rules can be so major and so limiting as to require a major redesign just to make an enclosure manufacturable using injection molding. When designing your product's enclosure, be sure to consider the injection molding requirements from the very beginning. Mistake number eight is incorrect PCB landing patterns. All PCB design software tools include libraries of commonly used electronic components. These libraries include both the schematic symbol as well as the PCB landing pattern. All is usually good as long as you stick with using the components in these libraries. Problems begin when you use components not included in these libraries. This means the engineer has to manually draw the schematic symbol and the PCB landing pattern or import it from a, a third party source like Snap EDA. It's very easy to make mistakes when drawing a landing pattern. For example, if you get the pin to pin spacing off by a fraction of a millimeter, it will make it impossible to solder the part on the board. A handy trick to avoid this mistake is to print your PCB layout at a one-to-one -one scale. Then order samples of all the various components, mainly the microchips and the connectors, and then manually place them on the printed circuit board printed layout. This allows you to very quickly verify that all of the landing patterns are correct. And regardless of where these landing patterns come from, whether it's a built-in library with your software or that you got it from a third-party source or that you drew them by hand, doing this verification of printing them out and placing the components is always a smart decision. Mistake number nine, the PCB design is not manufacturable or it's too expensive to manufacture. So a via is a conducting hole in the PCB that connects signals from different layers. And the most common type of via is known as just a through via because it goes through all the layers of the board. Here you can see a cross-sectional view of three types of PCB vias. The one labeled number one is a through via. This means even if you only wanted to connect a trace from layer one to layer two, for example, all of the other layers also have this through via. This can act to increase the size of the board since the vias reduce the routing space on layers not even using the via. A blind via, on the other hand, like the one that you can see marked number two, connects an external layer to an internal layer. And then a buried via that you can see marked number three connects two internal layers. However, blind and buried vias have very strict limitations on which layers they can be used to connect. It's all too easy to use a blind or buried via that can't actually be manufactured or even prototyped. To understand the limitations of buried and blind vias, you must understand how the layers are stacked to make the PCB. Be warned though that even if you use them correctly, blind and buried vias drastically increase the cost of prototype boards. Many times their use will double your board cost initially, although this cost increase will be less significant once you reach higher production volumes. In almost all cases, it's best to avoid the use of buried and blind vias unless you absolutely must have the smallest PCB design possible. And finally, mistake number 10 is incorrect PCB layout of switching regulators. A switching regulator converts one supply voltage to another by temporarily storing energy and then releasing it to the output in a controlled fashion. The storage elements used are inductors and capacitors. Compared to simpler linear regulators, switching regulators are extremely efficient and waste very little power. However, they're also much more complicated to use correctly. The biggest complexity of using switching regulators correctly is designing the PCB layout. You can't just randomly lay down the components and connect them up. There are strict layout rules that you need to follow for switching regulators. Fortunately, nearly all data sheets for switching regulators will include a section discussing the proper layout as well as giving an example of how to do it correctly. And if you happen to pick a switching regulator that does not include an example layout, then I would probably suggest looking for an alternative solution. If you enjoyed this video, then you do not want to miss this video right here.